do me a favor and just give a warm welcome to our guests, Chuck and Helen Todd. It's, it's just great to have them with us this morning. This is our, uh, this is our third Sunday in our, uh, in our missions week, and uh, you're just going to be blessed by having Chuck and Helen with us this morning. So God bless you guys. Good morning, Bethel Church. It is so exciting for us to be here today, and we, my wife and I have so much to want, that we want to share with you, but I tell you, first and foremost, uh, we are living in the most exciting time in the history of the world. Never before has God's Spirit been poured out upon all flesh as it is right now. Never before have we been able to, each individual, each person here, have the opportunity to influence and communicate to so many people around the world as we have right here, right now. And also each and every one of us is blessed it's here and that we are in the greatest nation in the history of the world. Uh, nowhere has there ever been a nation that's as powerful and as wealthy as the United States is uh, in the history of the world. So we are at the perfect place at the perfect time in history. And right now God is in, in enabling us to be able to go, all of us, to be able to go and share the gospel in ways we've never been able to do before. I want to say that I was incredibly blessed by the worship this morning. The, how many of you will agree with me? There was power um, in worship. And I believe um, that God is changing the wind and is changing something in the atmosphere and is changing something in our hearts. I tell you, I was completely blessed and I'm blown away. Could have worshipped for another hour. So thank you so much, worship team. That was uh, powerful, powerful and outstanding. Uh, it, it is a great privilege for uh, Chuck and I to be at Beth Bethel Church for the second time. And this time is different, a little different uh, for us than the first time. Because when we came to your missions uh, Sunday, one of your missions Sunday through the month of May last time, our connection with Bethel Church where Pastor Ron and Pastor David and we knew that we, uh, by the grace of God, connected with these incredible Christian leaders and, and it was such an honor uh, to be uh, with you as their congregation. But since then, we have personally met some of you on the mission field and we have seen the anointing and the power and the fruit of the ministry that is taking place in Bethel Church and I tell you what it, it was just incredible um, to see Bethel Church members minister in Israel and Jordan and and be in the Great Commission hands-on and so I know that what you receive here every service uh, the the rich word that is being deposited in your hearts, it's being poured out into the nations. And so this time I came to friends, I saw friends, I hugged friends, and, and uh, so this is, this is just uh, incredible and special. And being here on the day of Pentecost, it's like, whew, God is up to something. Amen. Amen. Well, Again, there, I want to share a little bit of our verse was going on. We're talking about in Psalms 145, David is talking about exalting the Lord. Every day his praises will be on his lips. It says that uh, um, uh, every day I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and most worthy to be praised. His greatness no one can fathom. One generation comments on your works to another. They tell of your mighty acts. They speak of your glorious splendor and your majesty, and I will meditate on your wonderful works. You know, there's, and it goes on about the awesome works of God, and, and this is something we want to share with you. You know, every day God is doing unbelievable things. He's doing miracles that's beyond any understanding, and we're able to see some of these things, and we want, I want to share just a little bit about some of the things that we've been able to see on the mission field as an encouraging work, but more importantly, to know that if God can do these things, he can do anything you ask him to do. He's bigger than any of your problems. And one thing we want to know is, how many of you right now need a breakthrough? Does anybody here need a breakthrough in some aspect of your life? You know, most of us do, does. And I'll tell you, we are seeing today is the day. Here's the day of Pentecost. Today is the day of breakthrough. And amen. I, I, come on, let's give God praise. Today is the day of breakthrough. God has already secured it. 
It's there, it's waiting. And breakthrough can happen at any moment. There's a certain things I think we need to put in order and just to receive that breakthrough. You know, my, my son just graduated from college this year. And uh, he happened to be a commencement speaker. And he talked about his breakthrough that he had uh, on the racquetball court. And a lot of stories going on, but he, had, he was playing racquetball. And I've seen the video of his breakthrough. They had the big glass wall in the back of racquetball. He swung evidently to get the ball bounced up against the, that glass, and that glass could not contain him. He just went right on out into the uh, hallway of the court, glass everywhere, and uh, he said, well, I experienced my breakthrough. And um, it wasn't without some injury, but he did have his breakthrough. And, uh, it, and he talked about his breakthrough there, but I started thinking more and more. Sometimes we see these, these, these uh, restrictions in our life, and we think, hey, that's all the further we can go, but that's not the way God sees it. And sometimes we can, God has so much more for us than any of us can imagine. I want us to real quickly, um, uh, uh, and oh, let me get my verse here. I didn't get my verse up. But in, you may remember in, in um, whoops, you may remember in, uh, in, in Matthew after, after Jesus fed the 5,000, uh, he immediately, hits, the Bible says, and I didn't realize this before, but it says he made the disciples get on the boat and go on ahead of him. And I thought that's very interesting. He made them get on the disciples. That was their, their assignment. That was, their ordin- that was what they were supposed to do. They go on ahead of him. And they go out, and Jesus prays, and he finishes up some stuff there, I guess. And, and he goes and meets them, and he walks on the water right after that. And we all are familiar with the story of Jesus walking on the water. But I want to put it out. All the disciples are now on the boat. They're sending off. The storm comes. And there's waves and storms. There's a tempest there. And, and I'm sure there's a little bit frightful. There's a struggle. There's a tribulation that's going on. And many of us want to run from the struggle. We want to run for this tribulation. You know, all of us wants to be the diamond. But none of us wants to go through the pressure, the, the, the heat, the pressure that's required to turn coal into a diamond. You know, and so we, to avoid the pressure, we sometimes live our life just as briquettes. And, (laughs) but those that want to be that diamond, they're the ones that's going to go through, come what may, what God has for them, I want. And you know, there seems to be no wall for these people. In this trial, and God's blessing is often hidden in the trial, in the tribulation, in the tempest that we all want to avoid, but that's where the blessing God has, is right in that trial, in that tribulation. And we see in this thing, when they're in the boat, suddenly Jesus appears. They start screaming, oh, no, it's a ghost. It's a, and they think it's something evil when Jesus is coming in because they have this trial and the tribulation. Sometimes we look at that, too. I look in my life and history. I start realizing the greatest blessings I've had didn't look like a blessing going through it. When I come in, I start to look like a trial, look like a tribulation, looked like something evil. But in reality, that was God lifting me up to another level. And we want to avoid this, but what we're really doing is avoiding being blessed by God. We're avoiding being elevated to that next level. We're, we pray for breakthrough, but we want to avoid the breakthrough. You know, we want to avoid that tempest, that trial that's required to get to that breakthrough. And so here we're there, and then Jesus says, don't be afraid, it's me. In the midst of the storm, Jesus is walking out and says, don't be afraid. Now, the disciples are happy in the boat that, oh, great, Jesus is here. But Peter says, no, command me. Command me to go more. I'm, we're, he's, Jesus is right in the assignment that, God's, that Christ has told him to be. He's in his assignment. He's doing the minimums that Christ has told him to be as the, as the disciples. But Peter says, I don't want the minimums. If you're out there, I want more. I want more. Command me to do more. In the storm, in the tempest, I don't want just to make through it. I want to be more. I want out of this boat. I want out of the restrictions. I want that breakthrough. And he commands Christ, or he asks Christ to command him to do more. And this is an attitude that I think all of us needs to have in our Christian walk. And I'm so excited. I, t- I tell you what, I have, you've heard me talk about a relationship with Christ. I'm so much involved in a personal, intimate relationship with Christ. And I think that is always pushing boundaries. That is always looking for something fresh, something new. And I know I'm speaking to a church that, that, and, that's not bound by traditions. 
Here's a church that is already breaking through, is already pushing out, getting out of the box, doing the things that many other churches would scratch their head about, but you're pushing, you're moving into that movement, of, uh, that, that very presence of God, because God is constantly moving. God is, not stag- God is not still. He's always moving. And so for a church, for us, to be in that presence of God, we also have to be moving. We have to, have, have to be pushing boundaries. And I, I believe, and you've heard me say it before, a missions trip is going on a date with God. If you want to get to that intimate spot with God, go on a date with him. You get out of your culture, out of your, out of your comfort zone, out of your culture, and start sharing God's work, God's plan, when you're a little bit uneasy, you're a little bit uncomfortable, and you only have God to rely upon. You have that shared experience between just you and God will bind you together more closely. You're looking for a breakthrough? Get out of your comfort zone and push forward. We have, I was going to bring the book up here, a friend of ours from Texas. He's a doctor, a medical doctor. And he's, he's a, a very strong Christian evangelist. He does great things. But his training, and he's a very good medical doctor, and he wanted to come do uh, medical teams on our trips. And we, I was excited at something I had been praying about for a while. So he or, helped organize all of our medical teams, but he went on a trip to Iraq. Now, here was something that was truly out of his comfort zone. He heard God call him to Iraq. He went. He was submissive to God's call. But he was, I can't say he was unafraid. Every aspect, everything scared him. He turned around. You can tell he was nervous. He's trying to push through. He's putting on a brave face, but everything in Iraq was scaring him. And he didn't understand completely the culture and all this, but I want to share a little bit. So he, there's several folds in this thing that I want to share, because in addition to this, we, there was a church in Iraq that has been a friend of ours. We'd seen this church start. It had done very well, and it started to have some very, it had ran into some very serious problems. Now, they fixed the problems, but the reputation of the church was damaged, and Nobody was coming. The church was, in my mind, the church was about ready to die. It was a good-sized church at one point, but it had less than, less than a dozen people showing up on Sundays. The church was just a shell. And my heart went out because I knew that God's plan was here. So we took, for two days, we took the medical team from our work and put it in this church to try to see if we can help out this church in any way we could. It just so happens, the Yazidis that you may have seen, it's a religious, it's a Kurdish people, that was also being attacked by ISIS. They had just come through. They're refugees in the area, and they have nothing. And when this, this is very close to where this church was, and they said, our medical team, they come running in, and they needed the medical help. So we was able to reach out and minister to them. One of the women that was there, they got on the, started to examine her, uh, and she appeared to have died on the table. There's, it's just motionless. And the doctor started thinking, oh, my goodness. If somebody comes in, walks into the clinic, and then dies here, how's that going to affect us? You know, it can't be good for ministry. And said, and I don't know their culture. Maybe they'll have revenge and kill us all. And what, what do we do? You know, he was a bit nervous. Well, the nurses come out and said, I don't think she's dead. But they, she was stiff as a board. They'd move her. She was just completely stiff. And they started realizing it may be demonic. They started praying, and, and they cast, started casting demons out of this woman. Well, she came, was completely changed. She accepted Christ on the spot. Her family started to. What miracle just came before everyone's eyes? It became a reputation that spread like wildfire in the area. People started coming. The Yazidis, which is a, the, the Muslims call the Yazidis as um, Satan worshipers. It's an oversimplification of their religion, but probably accurate. Um, they all started accepting Christ in unbelievable numbers. Then the reputation started moving out among the areas, and people that had gone to the church that would not go back again started becoming curious. They started coming back to the church. Other people from other religions started coming in and started curious and started coming and confessing their heart to Christ, all because of this one trial and tribulation that came in, and a lot because this doctor heard from God, got out of his comfort zone, got on an airplane at his expense, his trial, his, his discomfort, went there, submitted to God, and by doing all of these things lined up, a breakthrough happened. I went to this church six months later, went back to Iraq. On the midweek service, 
which they didn't have one earlier. The midweek service was 160 people, standing room only. You couldn't sit down. There's no place to sit. Uh, all the people were packed in. It all was because one person submitted to God, got out of the comfort zone, flew overseas on that destiny from God, and made a breakthrough in his life, in the community's life, in that church's life. It multiplies over and over again. Okay, as you saw uh, in the video, it mentioned that World Missions Alliance is involved in the 22 countries around the world. So the only continent that we are not reaching currently is Australia, and um, Chuck likes to add Antarctica. <laughs> so I don't know what God has in mind for these continents, but all the other continents uh, we have touched with our outreach. We never have a plan to add more nations uh, to our outreach because we are comfortable right where we're at. We, let's, let's face it, we all like a comfort zone, right? <laughs> but God um, does not like us to stay there, and so he opens doors to the countries, and, and we follow the call. And this has been going on for almost 20 years. So next year, World Missions Alliance will celebrate its 20th anniversary. And so even though in uh, God's perspective, 20 years is not a long time at all, uh, for us humans... Two decades is a good amount of time that allows you to have sort of a perspective, look back and uh, perhaps see the pattern that God has in the calling for you. But I wanted to explain to you why the Great Commission is so personal to Chuck and I, because it's, it's not just the um, calling that God uh, gave us, but it's also our lifestyle, it's our passion. And... Um, for me, it's because I have been on uh, both ends of it. I was a mission field, and then I became a missionary. So uh, you heard in the video that I am from Russia originally, but to be more correct, I'm from the former Soviet Union, because when I was growing up there, it wasn't Russia, it was the Soviet Union, and it was still under communism, the end years of communism. And so I grew up in a communist country, and uh, basically I was told both at home home and at school that God does not exist. But ever since I remember myself, I had this desire for God in my heart. And I believe that all of us are born with the desire for God, with the empty space that only God can fill. But I didn't have any outlet for it. And it wasn't until I was 14 years old that uh, my brother came home and he brought a piece of paper, and he was very excited that he got to speak to Americans in the street. He met a couple from the United States, and he got to practice his English. And this couple handed him a piece of paper, which he didn't even look at. He brought it home. But my parents were concerned, because back in those days, people in Russia were not allowed to speak to people from the United States in the street. There weren't that many people from the United States that came to Russia in those days. And so they were already a little concerned. And then when they looked at this piece of paper, they were even more so concerned because this piece of paper was talking about God and Jesus. It was a gospel track. And so um, while my brother was in trouble, I picked up this gospel track and I read it. And for the first time in my life, I I had what I was looking for, a very simple message that told me that God was real. And not only he was real, but he loved me so much that he allowed his son Jesus to die on the cross for me. And fortunately, there was a sample prayer at the end of the gospel track because I didn't know how to pray. But this, um, the track said, if you just um, repeat this prayer and you ask Jesus into your heart, you can have God. You in your life. And so that's exactly what I did. As simple as that, at the age of 14, I asked Jesus into my heart. And it wasn't until five years later that um, when communism uh, was brought down and the Soviet Union fell apart, uh, I was a college student by then, I received my first Bible. And then uh, God directed my path um, to uh, meet Chuck and uh, um, you know, the rest is history. And then uh, in his um, infinite wisdom and, and um, perfection of his plan, 
God positioned us as a couple and as a ministry to go to the nations, much like Soviet Union was back then. The nations where the gospel message is either forbidden or unaccessible or difficult to spread. And I see the logic. I see the pattern because I get to do for other people what God has done for me through that missionary couple in the 80s. And so the beautiful part about this story is that I never got to meet this couple. I didn't, I don't have the visual of their faces. And perhaps they didn't get to see the fruit of their labor. They were called to the Soviet Union to sow, to plant the seeds. I know that most likely they didn't get to preach a sermon. Probably 90% um, sure they didn't get to lead someone in salvation prayer. They were called to plant seeds. Um, these little gospel tracts that I know that in many churches they collect dust. You know, I've shared my testimony in, in many places across America, and people say, thank you for this encouragement. We almost gave up on the gospel tracts, and um, now we're encouraged to uh, continue to give them out. And I want to say I'm a huge believer in the printed Word of God, whether it's in the form of a gospel track or a Bible. I, I think that, um, and I know that you agree with me, it is the most powerful weapon that has been given to us, that is has the ability to penetrate the hardest of the hearts. It can reach children. It can reach old people. It can reach criminals. It can reach good people who live without the knowledge of God. It's a tool that um, equips us for any kind of mission, for any kind of vision that God casts around us. And so um, we as a ministry uh, hugely believe in the distribution of the Word of God. In every country where God calls us, we make it a point in one way or the other distribute the word of God. So I didn't get to meet these folks, but I know that there will be um, a moment uh, for them and for me that our paths will be crossed in heaven, and I will be able to come up to them and tell them, hey, I'm here because of you guys. I'm here because you had the courage to respond to the call. I'm here because somebody had the obedience to equip you with these gospel tracts. I'm here because the angel of God turned the head of the customs agents on the border of the Soviet Union, and they were able to smuggle these gospel tracts. Um, you see, the Great Commission has so many parts uh, within it, and each one of us has the ability and the opportunity to be a part. I love the fact that when uh, Christ gave the Great Commission, he didn't give it to a certain group of people within the church. Um, he, it's an assignment for all of us, but it's not just an assignment because I think there is a tradition within the church culture to look at the Great Commission as something that we know we're supposed to do this and we know it's a good thing and we have a budget assigned in our church to support missionaries and the programs, and we pray for our missionaries, but it's really not for me, you know. I, but I do my part. But the Great Commission has three parts to it, and every one of them uh, is more than just an assignment. It's like Pastor David said earlier, it's an invitation for a partnership. Um, God is not a great puppet master who moves us across the chessboard to fulfill his uh, plan. He is a father who invites us to collaborate. He gives us the opportunity to be co-labored. This is a little mind-boggling if you think about it. The creator of the universe uh, has room for us in his plan to be the co-laborers. This is, this is not a chore. This is, this is an honor to be invited um, to be a part of this. I believe that his plan for humanity will be accomplished. We have anchors in the Bible, and uh, it's the end-time prophecies, and they're going to be fulfilled with your help or without your help. Um, if we are not willing to respond to this invitation, there will be others. And so the end result will be the same. By why would we not to be a part? of this incredible invitation. Why would we want to miss out on what God has for us? 
Uh, we have observed. So our ministry is very much twofold. Uh, well, number one is to preach the gospel in these nations. Not all of them are outwardly closed. Uh, Chuck mentioned Iraq, and we uh, actually pioneered a church there. We started a church there, phenomenal uh, opportunity. So Iraq, oh, it sounds like, my goodness, that's a, that's a scary country. But if you want to know the truth, um, in my uh, list of dangerous countries, France is a lot more dangerous uh, than Iraq because it's uh, spiritually so hard. And, and so it's a, in my opinion, it's a much more difficult mission field. I will actually go to Iraq anytime before I go to France. But God called us to France too, and somebody has to do the hard work. Uh, and so um, the nations, uh, I, I consider every nation where he called us closed because it's closed either physically or spiritually. And and so, uh, uh, the, you know, the, the opportunity, though, in every country, just like Chuck said, now is the time. In each one of these nations, when we set our foot there, we recognize now is the time. Uh, I had a team from Bethel with me in uh, Israel and Jordan in January of this year. And so in Jordan, we got to uh, visit refugees from Iraq and Syria. Uh, many of them were Muslims. And, and uh, uh, all of them were in incredibly broken and hurt people with the stories that were heart-wrenching for us to hear. And some of them, at one point or another, were the people that we would consider our enemies. You know, the people of the faith that is aggressively against Christianity. And yet, God called the people from Bethel to these people. And I know that they had to overcome some hesitations, perhaps fears, perhaps other obstacles. I know that every time when God calls us to do something, it's always an assignment far greater than what we can accomplish in the natural. There is always obstacles involved. It could be uh, financial limitations or health limitations or just lack of confidence in ourselves and wondering what is it that I have to offer to God. There's always something to overcome, but the tool uh, that connects us to this divine assignment and divine purpose is the obedience. In spite of these obstacles, in spite of our limitations, we just obey the call. And um, one of my favorite uh, uh, missions passages in the Bible, which not is not normally mentioned as a missions passage, but it's in Acts chapter 9, when uh, there is an ordinary man, Ananias, suddenly... The winds have changed in his situation because he hears the voice of God uh, who calls him by name. And Ananias so obediently says, yes, God, I'm here. I'm excited. What do you have to say to me? Um, he doesn't like what he hears next because uh, God has an assignment for him to a terrorist. A terrorist by the standard of... Um, the time, because that's what Saul was towards Christians. It would be what some ISIS leader is to us today. Someone who is intent on persecuting, killing, imprisoning people who follow Christ. And so this assignment that is cast before him is way out of his comfort zone. And I think it's very cute how he's trying to remind God that Saul is a dangerous, dangerous man, as if God has forgotten about that. And I, I think it's very powerful how God responds to Ananias because he doesn't address the fears of Ananias. He explains to him why it is important for him to go. He explains to him that Saul has a great purpose in his plan, that Saul has a destiny and future that is essential for God's plan. And this is why Ananias is called. He doesn't give Ananias the assurance of safety and the assurance of success or victory. He just explains to him why this assignment is important. And of course, the response of Ananias, I'm sure he's still afraid because God didn't say you're going to live. God didn't say you're going to survive this trip to this straight street. But he goes. And as a result, he ends up being one of the heroes of the uh, New Testament. And that's the only time that he's mentioned 
In the whole book of New Testament, is in Acts chapter 9. That was his destiny and his obedience in spite of fear, in spite of the danger of the assignment. His obedience connects him to the destiny for which he was created. Would Ananias have made it to heaven if he said no? Of course, because he was a follower of Christ. Would Ananias live the purpose for which God created him? No. And so we see the Great Commission as this marvelous plan, um, a divine strategy, if you will, that God has for his people. Uh, one of the most exciting things uh, happened on um, just last month when Chuck took a team to China. And we have been working in China since inception of World Missions Alliance, since 1999, so for almost 20 years. And uh, when, uh, one of our first trips there um, at the time, the people came forward to accept Christ in China in masses. There was no way that we can remember every single face of, the, uh, of those who got saved in our services. But when Chuck went back to China in uh, March of this year, uh, there was a man that found him and said, you probably don't remember me, but I got saved when you came to China in 1999. I was among those who accepted Christ. Well, today I own a factory that makes solar panels, a pretty big deal. Uh, and so he says, I want you and your team to come to my factory and preach the gospel to my workers. Can you imagine this happening in America? The union would be all over this thing. But he stops the work of the factory for two hours. He brings the workers into the auditorium, and he has our team preach the gospel to these workers, and 35 of them accept Jesus in that meeting. How crazy is that? You know, to me, this is such an incredible example of how the Great Commission works. God does not call us into the nations to solve the problems on a grand scale. Sometimes he gives us these solutions uh, just because we are walking in his will and in his favor. But initially, he just calls us to an obedience, to respond to the invitation. And whether it's showing up in a country and passing out gospel tracts, uh, whether it's showing up and giving someone a hug at the right moment, listening to their tragedy, to their story, and just equipping them with the Word of God. It's, it doesn't start big. It starts with a small seed, the seed, the size of a mustard seed, but it produces big harvest. And, and to be a part of that is an incredible honor, but also to be a part of that is a way that we bring uh, a breakthrough in our our own lives. I believe that if we make God a priority, his work, his business a priority in our lives, he takes pleasure in taking care of our needs and, and bringing a breakthrough in our own circumstances. So our challenge for you today, we're incredibly thankful for partnering with Bethel Church in the Great Commission. It is a great honor and a privilege for us. We are thankful for your support. We're thankful for your prayers. And we're thankful for those who feel called to go and, and partner with us on the field and experience what God has for us on the field. We want to be able to give you an opportunity to experience the Great Commission in every facet of it. If God is calling you to go, we have a trip for you almost every month scheduled, and our destinations are exciting and incredible, and you're going to meet lifelong friends. If God is calling you to give, we encourage you to support the missions program of Bethel Church because it produces an eternal impact, and you want your money to be sown into something that is not temporary but eternal because then the benefits that you reap from these checks are eternal as well. It's just smart financial strategy. But also, we want to invite you to pray because it doesn't matter. Uh, some of you may not be in the season to go or maybe not even in the season to give right at this moment, but we have all the, the ability to pray. If you visit uh, the missions display there after the service, we have these prayer cards. Um, they represent, each one of them represents the countries uh, that we reach. And, and it gives you, in a nutshell, the information about the country and how to pray 
pray for this country and also when to pray for our teams when they're in this country. And I want to encourage you to take one or or all of them and, and just put them on your fridge and pray and see what God does in your life. Prayer is just the beginning and prayer connects you to that nation as your inheritance because that's what God said, I will give you nations for your inheritance. Hey, we're sowing money into the eternal and also we're collecting nations for our intern inheritance. I can't imagine anything more exciting, more eternal and more life changing that we can be a part of. Thank you so much, Pastor David, for allowing us to share. Thank you, guys. God bless you. That was awesome. Encouraging. Exciting, isn't it? You know, first, I, I want to encourage you. Um, some of you think this is an impossibility for me because of where where you're at. I've seen a lot of miraculous things happen when someone, someone determines that they're going to go on a missions trip. Um, God just so, oftentimes just drops money in your lap. We've, you've heard testimonies about that. People who didn't have the financial means to go on a trip and all of a sudden the money just, just appears because they position themselves for that thing. And um, I don't think there's a better, a better way outside of prayer. Prayer is important. But I really believe, um, you know, we can worship God, or we can worship other things, and we can worship mammon. And I, 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 think, I think sometimes we don't experience breakthrough because, because we, we worship mammon. We worship money. And I don't think there's, there's a better way to, to position yourself for breakthrough than to give. I really don't. I've seen, that, I've seen that in my life because what it does, it testifies that I trust you, God, as my source. Not my job or my creativity, even, even though he gives you all those things. But, but you, you tell God, you are, you are my source. Every penny that comes in to missions goes directly to missions. It, it doesn't, we don't have, you know, put it towards administrative costs. It goes directly towards missions. And I will tell you that often we're short, but we make up the difference in, in you know, just the, the general giving that comes in that's not designated for, for something. But... Um, I want to encourage you to really stretch yourself um, because as you can see here and as was, was testified by, by Chuck and, and Helen, the money's well spent. How can you put a price on one person's salvation? How can you put a price on that? I mean, one, two people who were faithful to go on a missions trip to hand out a gospel tract to someone's brother ends up in the lap of someone who gets saved, gets called to missions, and because of Chuck and Helen's faithfulness, who know hundreds and thousands have been saved because of the message that they, they bring because they were, they were faithful to make sacrifices. Trust me, God will bless you. God is your provision. There's no lack in him. There's no poverty in him. If, if the Holy Spirit's directing, directing you to give, then give and you will experience breakthrough. I, bank on it. I promise you that. So, Lord, we thank you, Father, that, that um, we get to partner in all these works. We, we may never go to these countries that were talked about, but through our financial support and through our prayers, that goes into our account. People who go on these trips and, and, and uh, folks that are healed and come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, if we're praying for these missionaries and we're helping fund them, it goes into our account. And Lord, I thank you, Father, that we can be a part of this awesome work that you're doing in this city, in this nation, and in this world because people are faithful to take that truth and, and to take the call on our lives and be faithful to walk it out. So Lord, we thank you for the message that was spoken today and this opportunity that we get to give to these awesome, awesome work. And uh, Lord, this is all about expanding your kingdom and we want to be a part of that. So we thank you, Father. This bless, this giving, multiply it in every way. In Jesus' precious name, amen.